All right. So yeah, welcome very much this evening. Um, we have it, uh, and I will kind of mute people. Um, I think it's nice to keep your cameras on if you want to, as, as you know, as long as we're not eating a lot of ice cream, which I might be doing. Um, and then uh, we'll just keep it kind of quiet with the mute buttons. Um, and I don't please don't consider me rude by by muting you. It's it's to help hopefully. Um, I think if you have questions, it might be better to wait towards the end. We have a chat menu. You can kind of type it in the chat if you want. But if it's a really important question, you might be able to raise your hand. And that's in the bottom where you have reactions and you can kind of raise your hand. Um, if something's really funny, you can, can laugh um, as long as it's polite. And Emily means it as a joke. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, My jokes aren't funny. But so we're excited tonight to have Emily. Um, it's going to be co-hosted. Um, by the Lake Lewis chapter, and of course, the Palouse Falls chapter. Um, um, I help out Lloyd Stos and the wonderful group at the Palouse Falls chapter with some talks. Um, our fall talks will probably be Jack Nisbet, who's a local historian and author, and he's going to focus on the Ice Age floods. And then we'll have um, Bruce Bjornstad come and do his presentation of the new book, um, which I think he's already done for the Palouse Falls, but it's, it's pretty neat and it's published. And the Ritz in Ritzville has its own theater, um, and it might be fun to watch that. And then Gary and the Lake Lewis chapter will have the amazing world-class geologist, uh, Steve Rydell, come and talk about something wonderful. And we'll probably try to get him to come to Eastern Washington University in the spring, too, to talk about palladium. But enough of that. Let's introduce tonight's speaker, um, which is Dr. Emily Cahoon, um, who has gotten her master's with the wonderful John Wolfe at WSU and then did her PhD with the amazing Martin Streck. Um, and has risen to great heights in the geologic community lately um, as with her amazing work in the Columbia River Basalts. Right now, she's virtually teaching um, with University of Anchorage, or oh, man, what, uh, geological sciences at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. Um, and then we'll keep on moving on with life and doing amazing things. I've always been impressed every time I've seen Emily. Um, so tonight, she's going to talk tonight about uh, hidden gems using sunstone bearing lavas in the Columbia River Basalt Group to explore magmatism within the flood basalt provinces. Woo! So welcome, wait, welcome, Emily. Well, thank you for that, even though most of those are fables. Um, I appreciate it. It's always, it's always good to see you. Um, so yeah, let me get started here. All right, here we go. I'd like to get myself oriented. Yes, so as, as Chad said, I will be talking about um, basically this very unique gemstone that exists in Columbia River basalt lavas and how we can use this to understand more about magmatism within flood basalt provinces. Because I'll give you, actually, I'll give away some of the kind of the end is that they're potentially not just unique to Oregon. Um, and this, this picture here, even though it looks like it might be the cover of a pretty sweet geology band, it in fact is not that. Um, it is a visit to one of the sunstone mines down in sort of the plush Oregon region. So you can kind of just think um, center and south. There are a few commercially operational mines down there. And this visit was Gosh, it must have been, it was summer of, um, or the end of 2019. And actually it's it, this picture I particularly like because one, you can get an idea, this, this lava flow actually that we're looking at hosts sunstones. And just looking at it from this angle, right? It doesn't look like much, might not look that exciting. Um, but here we have the owner of this mine. This is the Spectrum mine. Uh, we have an undergrad student at, from PSU. And down here in the corner, we have actually the pretty much the best gemstone cutter of sunstones pretty much in the world. His name's Daryl Alexander. And this is his son who at the time was 16 or 17. And he's won basically gem cutting competitions. He's the youngest um, person to win sort of the highest award that he has. So visiting some of these places can be really cool because it's not just you get outside kind of your uh, niche of, you know, exactly geochemistry or volcanology and you get to meet some pretty cool people. And because I wasn't sure entirely who would be here, I figured I would just make um, 
oh, that wasn't supposed to happen, just make a touch on the fact that I got interested in geology from a pretty young age. Um, maybe my parents didn't make some of the best um, safety decisions here in a baby backpack, precariously balanced on a boulder. Um, I'll also give, give away that I fell later this day um, and my mom was not pleased. And making some uh, also great parenting decisions along with some great fashion choices a little bit later when I was in a cave, questionable hard hat here, uh, but I look pretty happy. And my parents were really into mineral and rock collecting. So as I grew up, I kind of grew up around it. And as a kid, you know, I went on the trips, but it wasn't until a little bit later that I became interested. So this started off, um, I, was, I was pretty young. And just in case anyone, we don't have um, maybe full-blown geologists in the audience, for any geologists in training, I wanted to just mention that most of this will be talking about basalt. And we classify basalt based on the silica content, which I have covered up here, and sodium and potassium are alkalized here. And so basalt is a chemical composition of lava that is rich in iron and magnesium and relatively low in silica. And it has a pretty low viscosity, which allows it to travel pretty far distances relative to other compositional types of lava. Um, and because I can't talk about um, growing up and be starting to get interested in geology without a good picture of my friend, Harry Dalton here, um, Pierce Brosnan in the 1992 blockbuster, best movie, um, Dante's Peak, um, filmed in Wallace, Idaho. So not too far away. And um, it's funny because I use this movie actually pretty frequently in some, in different classes uh, in terms of what's wrong with it. But um, if you have seen the movie, the scene where the lava flow comes bursting through the cabin and how low that viscosity was, how easily it sort of flowed, you can kind of sort of envision that in terms of the viscosity of basalt, which is the type of composition we'll be talking about today. Okay. I'm actually going to do this a little bit backwards in the sense that I'm going to start with kind of um, the large scale geology, which may seem like it's in the right order, but I wanna talk about how we got there in the first place. Um, of course, I'm realizing now some of my slide transitions duplicated into um, other slides and that's why these things keep progressing forward, which that was my bad. Um, things you learn, right? So, ah, I'm so mad at myself for doing this. Um, the, actually I can figure this out. There we go. Um, the Columbia River Flood Basalt Province is a massive eruption of um, basaltic lavas that covered Eastern Washington and Oregon about 17 and 16 million years ago. And I'm sorry for this, this is just not pausing. Um, this was sourced from the Yellowstone plume. And it's really important because they are associated with um, basically really large scale eruptions. Um, and I'm sorry, I am going to try to remove this because this is driving me crazy. Hold on one second. You know, oh my gosh. How I, mm. okay, um, so yeah, I always do, I tend to duplicate slides a lot with the formatting, um, so lesson learned to me. Um, okay, so I kind of, I said, you know, I was interested in geology at a young age, went over what basalt was, and the Columbia River Basalt Group, which um, now that we got all our transitions in order, um, the world's youngest and the smallest in terms of volume, eruptive volume, flood basalt province. Um, it was a massive outpouring between about 17.2 and 16 million years. I should have put an asterisk though next to this because there is a lot of ongoing debate. Um, and as I said, erupted from fissures or cracks in the ground all across Eastern Washington and Oregon. So the extent of the gray polygon is the approximate extent of the Columbia River basalt lavas I'll probably just say CRBG from now on. 
And this used to be kind of pre-95, um, pretty much this northern extent. And then after 95, the Steens Basalt was kind of lumped in to the CRBs. And the Snake River Plain generally connects the extent of the CRBs to the current location of the Yellowstone hotspot. To make sense of all of these lavas, because you know, if you've driven down the gorge um, or you've been to Steens Mountain or you've been out to WSU, you know, you see these huge stacks of basaltic lava. And to make sense of them, we have to kind of to come up with a story, we have to kind of figure out a way in which we can divide them so we can start to tell a story. And when we do that, we do it pretty much on the basis of where they were erupted, how old they were, and their geochemical composition. And when we do that, we get four different groups. And that's what I'll talk to you about for the next um, kind of first portion. This, as I kind of said, this will be broken into two segments where the first is kind of giving you an overview of my PhD research, which really looked at one specific formation of the CRBs, which is the picture gorge basalt. And then the latter portion using the information and sort of what I knew then about the picture gorge and the presence of sunstones, what I've learned about sunstones and where that research is going. But in terms of why this is important, um, because the CRBs are the youngest and the smallest flood basalt province, well, flood basalt provinces are a type of large igneous province. And large igneous provinces represent really, really big eruptions. And their source is linked to yellow, to plumes, mantle plumes, um, similar to the Yellowstone plume or the Yellowstone hotspot. Although I'll mention there is a slight difference between hotspots and plumes. Um, plumes are, the, the connotation there is that it, there is a connection to the core mantle boundary. So if you see plume, um, it implies that there is a deep connection, a deep source. And large igneous provinces are correlated to mass extinction events. Not every single one, but the timing of mass extinction events or large shifts in our global climate um, tend to correspond with the dates that we have for many of these large igneous provinces. And I, this is one of my favorite cartoons um, from a cartoonist, Nathan Pyle, uh, obviously showing a comet cartoon, very excited to visit Dino World, um, unbeknownst to him that he is about to, to destroy it. But, uh, we all know that, or you know, have learned that an asteroid was the cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs 5 million years ago, but the largest flood basalt province, the largest large igneous province, also erupted at this time. And just two years ago, I was actually at a talk where someone was mentioning that actually, you know, we've dated the Deccan Traps. This is this flood basalt that is the same age as the dinosaurs went extinct, about 65 million years. And they were dating it and they said, actually, the Deccan traps, they think occurred before the asteroid. So potentially the, the sort of demise of the dinosaurs potentially started before the asteroid even hit the earth. Since there's been a lot of um, research on the other end saying, no, no, no. Um, in fact, the, the asteroid definitely hit first, but this is even you know, kind of still ongoing to some degree, uh, still a point of debate. So the point here being understanding flood basalt eruptions, their timing, their extent is really important, um, especially when their eruptions can cause so, so much sort of um, ecological changes. But going back to our, our good friend, the CRBs, it's broken into four main phase units on the basis of eruptive location, their age, and um, their kind of general extent, but mostly their geochemistry. It's their geochemistry that we use to really make sense. So these kind of bullet points are the top, are the same ones I showed you before. The next couple slides, and this is where those transitions had existed, um, basically show you how these can um, change. So this is the Steens basalt. Um, this is the southernmost of the four main phase units. And as we go through, 
These are the different, the four different main phase units of the CRB. Um, the picture gorge basalt is actually the smallest, or it was thought to be the smallest in extent of the four main phase members. And the only dating that had been done on it was um, actually potassium argon. So this is where my research kind of kicked in because the only dates that we had for these um, picture gorge basalts were um, potassium argon ages, and they just didn't make sense with the ongoing work, um, especially with a lot of more precise work that had been done, um, some uranium lead dating on zircons in between Steen's basalt lavas. So it begged the question, you know, um, it was worth sort of revisiting. So the CRBs were originally thought to have erupted over about one to two million years. Um, that was kind of what had been proposed initially. This interval started to be reduced. As I said, those more precise studies kind of came along. And most recently, the eruptive interval for the CRBs have been condensed to about just over half a million years. This is pretty different from what was originally proposed at about one to two million years. And this places basically the end of this kind of main phase volcanism at about 16 rather than about 15 and a half. And when you kind of think about the timeline, this is that's relatively significant. Also, um, there is a, um, a global warming that occurs around the same time that the CRBs are being erupted. So understanding exactly when the initiation of these eruptions started and when the bulk of the material was kind of finished being erupted is pretty important in terms of trying to understand the importance of the Columbia River basalt eruptions to this global warming of the planet. And that's referred to as the mid-Miocene um, climactic optimum. Uh, temperatures rose about four to six degrees C. Okay, so in this cartoon here, basically what I want to sort of draw your attention to is originally the CRBs were thought to start around 17 and the end of that main phase, as I said, was about um, you know, 15.6-ish. But these recent ages have really condensed that timing. Uh, Nikki Moore out of OSU, she did a PhD with Anita Brender. She got an age for pretty much the lowest steens and almost at 17 million. And then studies looking at um, using uranium lead and zircon basically dated a bunch of sort of interbeds within a few um, Imnaha and Grand Ron lavas and got some of the youngest of Grand Ron to be about 16.2. So again, really condensing that interval of CRB time. And as I mentioned, those potassium argon ages just don't make sense. These older potassium argon ages that we have for the picture gorge don't jive with all of these new high precision ages or other members of the CRB. So it's worth looking into. And this is kind of where, again, I said I was gonna set the stage in terms of my PhD research and sort of where this study took off. So those potassium argon ages, they were, they were great for the time, um, but their errors are so big. So those, er those potassium argon ages for picture gorge, um, about 15.9 to 14.7, but their uncertainties were almost a million years. So this makes them, especially when you consider that they don't, again, jive with the high precision recent other ages for the CRB, it was definitely worth looking into these um, lavas to see how in fact they relate to the rest of the exposures. Some recent studies had, I shouldn't say recent, this is Lord, almost 10 years ago now, um, some recent Earth studies had tried to look at these ages, these older potassium argon ages, and basically apply new decay constants. So they tried to take the raw potassium argon data that was collected back in the late 70s, and they tried to apply new decay constants and sort of recalculate the ages to see how they would change. And this kind of works, um, still doesn't entirely jive with some other field observations, but it makes a lot more sense than some of these younger ages. 
Um, and one thing to point out too is that the picture gorge basalt formation, right, one of these main phase units of the CRB, has one magnetic reversal in it. So the lower picture gorge, if you've ever been to the type section, um, this is pretty close to the John Day fossil beds, the lowermost flows are normally magnetized. So they were erupted when your compass would have pointed toward the geographic North Pole. The uppermost flows are reversed. Now it's been sort of assumed that this transition corresponds to the N1 R2 transition observed in Grand Ron. And it's because of these older potassium argon ages and this normal to reverse transition, it's been assumed that the picture gorge is coeval, erupted at the same time as Grand Ron. And what I have found does not make sense with that. So all things kind of leading to the picture gorge deserved to be revisited. And keep in mind, of that previous map that I showed you, again, where Picture Gorge is the smallest in terms of its spatial extent of the other, um, of all four members. All of the things that we knew about Picture Gorge were confined basically to the type locality, Picture Gorge, and a few samples um, nearby. So if you consider the whole extent, everything that we know about it was confined to almost one location. And back in 2011, my PhD advisor, Martin Strack, was doing some um, field work with uh, a few students, and they stumbled upon this textbook dike. I mean, have you ever seen anything so gorgeous? Beautiful, columnar, jointed, um, you know, horizontal, so um, perpendicular to the cooling surface, and you just have some sediments sort of right on either side of this beautiful dike. So they found this in 2011 and, you know, Martin B. Martin was like, I'm going to um, check it out, you know, geochemically, see what, see what this is. Because the relative location being in between um, John Day and Burns here, two bustling metropolises in central Oregon, the location maybe would make you think, oh, it's probably Steens. Steens basalt is um, larger in its spatial extent. And, you know, picture gorge, all this like southern kind of polygon here, they're really scattered flows. So if you're seeing this dike in between, um, it's, it's probably, eh, it's probably Steens. Well, he was pretty shocked to find out that in fact it wasn't, it was picture gorge. And so this motivated basically a study, which is where I came in in 2015 to do my PhD. And there were a number of sort of motivating questions um, that really are distilled from some of the things I've been mentioning for the last 20 minutes. And, you know, what is the spatial extent of the picture gorge? If you have this dike in kind of an area that also no, um, like no CRBs were really identified in this area. So if we have a dike, um, pretty, again, beautiful dike in the middle, um, what is the spatial extent of picture gorge? And I'll also mention, notice that this dike is like flush with the ground surface. Uh, this is uh, something that I'm really curious about and I, I think it potentially indicates there was a lot of uplift in this area because any picture gorge basalt dike that you see in the type locality sticks out like a shark fin or something from the surrounding uh, rock. But any of the dikes we see in this area look like this. They're just completely flat and if it weren't for a road cut, you wouldn't know it was there. But this, this motivated a study. And so it was, you know, determine the spatial extent. Um, how does that impact total area and volume? How do we make sense of stratigraphy when we don't have gorgeous um, outcrops? And what's the eruptive timing of the picture gorge? So these were sort of the motivating questions for this study. And at the time, I didn't know what a sunstone was. I had no idea. But starting this study, um, basically I went throughout all of the extent of that picture gorge and kind of a little bit further east. So I'm kind of covering the swath, mainly in between, again, those bustling metropolises of John Day and Burns, but also in a few different areas to see, hey, if I, if I find a basalt flow, if I find a basalt dike, 
and I'm in an area where CRVs haven't been mapped, um, is this picture gorge? And without worrying too much about all the geochemistry on the right, I just want to point out that the samples um, that were taken from all of these sort of abbreviations on the map are the little black dots on all of these um, plots on the right. And they overlie those little gray dots. And the gray dots are the previous geochemical analyses for Picture Gorge. So once we started getting, and we did a lot more locations than this. This is, these are just the samples we dated. Um, we figured out that, oh my gosh, um, all of these places are, are Picture Gorge. And this really extends the spatial distribution, but how old are they? Do they fit with what had previously been established in terms of um, ages? And in fact, we found that no, <laughs> they did not. So we did about 16 um, samples. We dated about 16 samples of these uh, picture gorge lavas and dikes that were scattered all across central Oregon. And I have highlighted for you here three different samples um, in blue. So um, West Myrtle Butte, Aldrich Mountains, and Snow Mountains, those are just the names. And they are in order on the right, and you can see the age plateau and also the inverse isochron. Hopefully what you get out of this is that these plateaus look damn good. Um, the error is relatively small, um, and we have a lot of steps in here. And for these three just that I'm showing you, um, you can see that we have a really robust age at about 16.22. And we also have some pretty good ages on the older end, getting creeping up to 17. We did have three ages in here that were older than 17, um, but I don't show you them because their their plateaus don't look quite as good. Um, so I'm I'm cherry picking a little in that I'm showing you the best. Uh, but the point here is that Picture Gorge really spans um, a number of of years, and it's much older than we thought. Remember that even with those recalculated ages, the oldest picture gorge was thought to be maybe 16.4, 16.5, but this is actually showing that picture gorge magmatism is initiating at the same time as the oldest, the only other like oldest date we have for the CRBs, which is in the steams. And of course, um, to be outdone, that one is 16.97. So from an important standpoint, this changes where the spatial extent of early CRBs um, were erupting. And thinking about the stratigraphy here, um, basically I tried to do some fancy modeling and figure out how I could extend distribution of specific members within the picture gorge. It was a lot of modeling um, and it's tough. It's actually, it was, it went out for review. Um, I'm currently working with a lot of, with my response to comments here, but um, trying to extend distribution of very specific members within the picture gorge when you don't have gorgeous exposures, when you just have those dikes I showed you, or in some case, a lava flow or two, it makes you start to wonder how do you extend distribution of specific lava flows um, when you don't have the exposures. And that is kind of the meat of when it comes to sunstones, because the sunstone localities that I'll be talking to you about are really discrete in terms of their location. And lava flows that have crystals that big, the viscosity is really high. They can't travel very far. And so it really starts to have you wonder, how do we start to make sense of stratigraphy? And how do we start to correlate between units if we don't have these gorgeous um, packages of lava flows. I'm gonna skip the next slide on geochemistry um, just in the interest of time so that we can get to the main sort of sunstone. Basically the, the bulk of my PhD research, so I mentioned you know, age and distribution, and it was also geochemistry. So really what is the, the age, the spatial distribution, and what are the geochemical signals behind the picture gorge basalt. Um, in essence, with the ages, we ended up having this range from about 17.23 being the oldest to about 15.76 being the youngest. Now, I'm 
still a little cautious about this 15.76 age only because the next youngest age we have is like 16.06 or something. But this 15.76 age, I've now dated four different times. So I, I, I don't think it's lying. Um, and I, the age is really robust. I have both ground mass and plagioclase. So the, the take home point here is that the picture gorge basalt basically erupted for the longest period of time of any of the main phase CRB members. Um, and it also represents the oldest age of, of the CRB. But through this, through all this work, um, there were a couple questions that came to light. Um, one thing that I actually tried doing and why I feel pretty confident about some of these ages is that we did this kind of interesting method in how we treated the basaltic ground mass prior to dating it. There, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of criticism out there in terms of dating basaltic ground mass instead of dating the plagioclase within it. But I found actually I ran into a lot more problems with the plagioclase and to help make sure that our ground mass was, was really fresh for dating. We did a number of things. Um, one being we looked at really, really small size fractions and we did this mild leach in hydrofluoric acid to remove alteration and that super improved some of our plateaus. So this is ongoing work at OSU that kind of came out of this. I also noticed some interesting age gaps in the picture gorge basalt, you can notice it's actually right here. It's almost 0.4 million years. Um, and this is something that I'm looking into more. The ages don't make sense with magnetostratigraphy. And so this is um, something that I'm not sure I want to tackle quite yet, but it's definitely a, a point for um, inquiry because basically this gap in time in picture gorge basalt um, flows, this is the extent in which that um, N1, R2 transition occurs. So I find it kind of odd that of all the ages we, we um, analyzed, all the samples, not one fits in the time frame of this N1, R2 transition, which is what was assumed to be picture gorge basalt um, timing. I'm not sure what we're going to do with that yet, but um, I'm hoping to do to do something uh, and also trying to understand the sort of magmatic footprint for where these CRB um, eruptions initiated out of. Because now, again, if you have steens and picture gorge erupting starting roughly at the same time, um, you know, what does that mean for the magma chamber? How? How is it, you know, if you're trying to basically pinpoint generally on a map where that magma chamber was, um, and you now have two locations that volcanism is initiating roughly at the same time, you know, how do you make sense of that? But my favorite thing that has come out of this is, um, even though we are 30 minutes in, um, I wanted to give you all that context so that you could kind of understand some of the questions and ongoing research that are continuing with um, the CRBs. And my favorite is the fact that picture gorge basalt lavas host sunstones. So when I started this project, um, I, I'm gonna skip through, I just had some information about those other things. So when I started this project, um, sunstones, again, I had never heard of. And my Martin Strack, my research advisor, gave me this terrible map and was like, go check out this location uh, because it is a sunstone mine much, much further north of the plush area. And since we had already figured out that a lot of basaltic outcrops north of um, sort of in that gap in between John Day and Burns, we already knew a bunch of uh, basalts in there were picture gorge, not steens. If there's a sunstone mine um, north of the extent of steens, it's worth checking out if it's picture gorge. Uh, of course, this mine is private. And so the map was terrible. And it took me a while to find it, but but I did it. And that's kind of where this, what this started. And this was only about a year into my PhD. So all of the, this data that I'm going to show you has been done in tandem with my PhD. So again, I wanted to give you that context of what I've done so that um, you can kind of see how this fits together. And this is all just really preliminary data that 
I was able to kind of sneak in because it did fit under the umbrella of my PhD looking at um, the picture gorge. So I'm quickly going to explain what a sunstone is, and I have lots of pictures, where they're found, some previous work and preliminary findings, and then basically tell you what this proposed study is. And uh, any day I should be hearing back from NSF. Um, and if the NSF gods look upon me kindly, I will be continuing this work over the next two years. But um, we'll see what happens. I don't want to get my hopes up. So sunstones in essence are basically a type of feldspar, plagioclase, and the variety labradorite. If you've taken mineralogy recently, this will um, maybe look um, strikingly familiar. Maybe it will um, give you some little bit of anxiety, but we're in this labradorite field here. So a type of plagioclase feldspar. And if you're not a mineralogist, you can kind of think about this um, as we classify different types of like apples. So if you have a fruit, and then you have apples, and then you have a Granny Smith apple, you have feldspar, you have plagioclase feldspar, and then you have labradorite. When labradorite has copper in it, we call it sunstone, which is a little bit misleading because you can have clear sunstones, but generally they're just pretty large and they're gemmy or gem quality, meaning um, they're pretty internally, they're, they don't have a lot of fractures um, ideally, and so you can um, cut and facet them pretty well. Lots of colors because of really small, um, but actually macro inclusions of copper. You can see them with your naked eye. And they are a naturally colored gemstone. They are classified by the Gemological Institute of America as a precious gemstone, hardness of about six to seven. So decent for jewelry in terms of how hard it is. And they are found exclusively, asterisk, in Oregon, known as Oregon sunstone. Um, so here is one, this was just a picture I took on my phone really quick, but you can see how the light is interacting. It looks like, um, right, you have some little pennies in there. Again, I had never heard of a sunstone um, prior to starting this research on the picture gorge basalt. Um, and so it's kind of funny that I've now transitioned a little bit into gemology just because the lava flows I study happen to contain a gemstone. So. I think I'm pretty lucky in that regard. This is a picture from uh, John Aldrich. He owns Double Eagle Mining down in Plush. And I show this to you first because I think it, I mean, he just took this with his phone, um, but you can really see how these little copper um, macro inclusions are dispersed throughout a sunstone. And granted this is mounted, he is in the process of uh, faceting it, but I mean, just really, unbelievable. They appear to be aligned along um, cleavage planes within either cleavage planes within the crystal um, or potentially um, like the twins. So they're all very, very, very parallel within the crystal itself. Where are sunstones found? So this diagram now should be super duper, maybe too much familiar. Um, but through that research that I was doing right in this area, um, that map that I was given, that was terrible, um, was right for kind of in here, right near Delintment Lake. Um, and I'll show you exactly what the map looked like. This was the map I was given. Um, and to give you some context, so I have the two different like big locations for sunstone localities. There are two primary localities, five primary mines, four of them are down in this rabbit basin plush area, and then we have one further north. So I was given this map and you could argue, Emily, you're a moron, there are coordinates in there. There are, but um, I thought I would just drive up Forest Service Road 41 and just like find it, right? You think mine, you think like, I don't know, some big operation, very wrong. It was very small um, and because most of these things are just exposed at the surface. You don't need a lot of infrastructure, especially further north. So Martin had given me um, this map and said, hey, uh, again, this was in 2016, and said, hey, uh, you know, this, this place apparently hosts sunstones. All the other sunstones are thought to be associated with Steen's basalt. So, but this one's so much further north and we know there are picture gorge basalt lavas here. You should go check it out. And so I did. Um, 
but I'll also tell you that all the assumptions that sunstones in the Rabbit Basin plush area are held in Steen's basalt is based on not one geochemical analysis. Took me about three years to figure that out. It has just been, it's one of those things that it's a nasty game of telephone that, I shouldn't say nasty. Um, for me, it was an annoying game of telephone that it was assumed that all the sunstones down here came from Steen's basalt because it was so close. Pretty fair assumption. Uh, but it eventually started becoming like, oh, well, sunstones are in Steen's. And that is not true. Um, every geochemical analysis I have for sunstones down in the plush area are, in fact, Picture Gorge. But um, I'm jumping ahead. I visited this mine, the Ponderosa mine, further north, and I got a sample. It's a little bit confusing because um, I didn't do a great job with colors here, but the hosting basalt of sunstones at um, this location, that was that northern mine, the Ponderosa mine, I grabbed a sample, wasn't really sure what to expect, and I compared it, this is a spider diagram, and all I want you to notice is that our Ponderosa mine basalt lines up pretty well with the gray. Um, this is one I have three other analyses and they all look, and this is just a spider diagram in terms of lots of other geochemical space. Turns out that this Northern mine, um, the basalt there is in fact picture gorge. So this is interesting because this means that sunstones are found in picture gorge basalt lavas. And this is a picture of um, their kind of mine set up itself. It's very inconspicuous. It, again, took me a little bit to find. Awesome to hang out there. Um, the owners are good people. And every time you go, you can pretty much almost instantly be welcomed with a frosty beverage. So again, this wasn't the focus of my dissertation. This was just kind of like a cool thing that kind of happened. And so it took me three years to eventually make it down to the main sunstone location and check out the sunstones down there. Three years, again, this wasn't the focus of my dissertation, it was just something kind of cool. And we got two different whole rock analyses. One was from, I say just plush mine generally because it's from that location, but these are from two different mines. And again, on a spider diagram, our black lines most closely resemble the light gray the picture gorge basalt. Again, these are spider diagrams. There are other, in most other geochemical space, um, all of these samples lie really well over the picture gorge. So this is pretty damn cool. Um, but mostly you can tell they don't look anything like steams. So that sort of assumption that all sunstones were hosted in steams basalt, not entirely accurate, pretty cool. But besides, Okay, Emily, picture gorge basalt versus steams, who cares? Um, why are sunstones there in the first place? I mentioned that copper is in these um, feldspar crystals. That's what gives them their color. Copper has no business going into feldspar. And that's the point of this kind of, um, this ongoing research. But it was first identified as copper over a hundred years ago. Um, it is the state gem of Oregon. The earlier studies had confirmed elevated copper in, um, in these crystals, but all of these studies that have been done previously have been really coming from a gemological perspective. Um, they're interested in the coloration, what's causing it, not necessarily how did copper get in there in the first place. And just to give you an idea on gemology, um, they can range between about ten to a thousand dollars a carat based on their um, their color. So these things are pretty valuable. And also to give you um, just a fun fact, a carat is just a unit of mass, and it's five times the gram. So one carat is just 0 0.2 grams. Just fun fact, and it is different from kT. So KT, carat uh, with gold, that's a unit of purity. CT here, 
is just a unit of mass. Um, but they are ethically bind and Portlanders love our local goodies. So um, if you've ever watched Portlandia, you'll appreciate this. Um, they are local. And they're becoming more popular across the global jewelry markets, especially as people are becoming um, more conscientious of where their uh, materials come from. The only kind of downside here is that in, in, in traditional gemology, if something has an inclusion, it decreases its value. Um, most of us are probably familiar with that with diamonds. Unfortunately, with sunstones, that's what gives them their uniqueness. They're literally like snowflakes in that every single one is unique because how the copper has been dispersed in the crystal is different. Uh, but because they are included there, it is, it's difficult to get um, really a full understanding of their value because what makes them super cool and unique also is sort of a, a downside in traditional gemology. Uh, but this is, just gives you an idea of some colors Okay, so some just preliminary findings, um, getting sort of toward the end here. Well, this has been, I'm not gonna lie, this has been a cluster. That first mine, I said the Northern mine, the one that I, I visited initially, that was one of the actual picture gorge basalt lavas that I dated. And the date I got was about 16.2, 16.18. Um, cool, okay. Great, so not only does that Northern mine, not only is the geochemistry similar to Picture Gorge, but we know we're in the right age. We're not looking at some weird older or younger um, basalt. We know we're looking at CRB and we can now confirm this based on the age and the geochemistry. However, this is a ground mass age. I tried dating um, two sunstones and the Data itself doesn't look terrible, but it doesn't make any sense. Um, here it is. <laughs> so this is one of the ages I got for a sunstone. And it may take you a second, but how on earth do you have an 8 million year old crystal in a 16.2 million year old lava? And I'll tell you the closure temperature of um, both basalt and plage are really similar. So it's not like the plage could be reset and the ground mass was fine. Um, they have very, very similar closure temperatures. And considering now that I've done this with a few different um, samples at that Northern mine, it seems to be a consistent um, conundrum, I guess, that the, the sunstone is much younger and the basalt is much older. Um, and this is the inverse isochron. Uh, what's interesting here is that all of the points really cluster toward atmospheric. And I will mention a little bit later why in a few minutes, um, why that's important. This diagram uh, is, I'll come back to this uh, because this gets into sort of a controversy of how, how much integrity this argon data may have. So, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but yeah, what I, what I want you to think about here is that at this stage, we have our Northern mine. Uh, we have now three different ground mass analyses, and I know that it's picture, you know, it jives with picture gorge basalt. In this Southern sort of plush rabbit basin area, we have two different geochemical analyses. Again, also matches picture gorge basalt. And since we have an age further north, right, of the 16 point, um, I'll go back one, the 16.2 basically for the ground mass, it's pretty fair to say that probably the southern mines are also this age. But how do you make sense of this weird younger plagiate? So this takes us to basically two two potential avenues. Um, and I'm going to, I'm gonna skip this first, actually for a second. Um, this takes us to two potential avenues and it's basically what is the origin of sunstones? Are they magmatic or are they hydrothermal? Because you know, if you're trying to understand when these things were erupted, 
it doesn't already, it doesn't make sense that the sunstones are younger than the hosting basalt. Um, but then the question becomes, well, the sunstones or like the plage itself has to be magmatic, right? You don't form plagioclase crystals um, hydrothermally. It's not a hydrothermal mineral. So, okay, but maybe the copper got in hydrothermally. And so the question that we're really looking into is when and how did the copper get into these crystals? Um, was it magmatic or was it hydrothermal? And so to go back one, I'll say that copper has no business going into plagioclase. If you are familiar with, the par with partition coefficients, it's super, super low. And so our two options, again, reflecting that magmatic or hydrothermal, if it's magmatic, that means the copper went in during crystal growth. Still doesn't make sense because copper shouldn't go in to plage. Um, or the copper went in after the plage formed, hydrothermally. And this could have been at or near the surface. I will tell you though, I don't really understand. It seems too convenient to me that the plage could have gone in um, at or near the surface when our two sunstone locations are like 80 miles apart as the crow flies. Because if this is a near surface, unique occurrence, why on earth would you have sunstones almost not existing anywhere else and then independently formed 80 miles apart, right? How, like, how, how could that happen? Um, it just seems too convenient um, or too kind of too odd. And if that did happen, people have argued, okay, well, maybe the copper came in from the hosting basalt. Maybe the copper like diffused in. I had an undergrad, um, Stephanie, who worked on this at PSU um, about a year ago. And basically what she did is look at copper concentrations in the hosting basalt to see if copper decreased as it got closer to a sunstone. Maybe the copper was being leached from surrounding basalt into the sunstone. And basically what she found, she did this kind of transect um, from the edge of a sunstone into a basalt. And here we only have major elements, but um, if you, you can imagine that if something is leaching copper out, copper is not gonna be the only element affected. And essentially what she saw is that once you entered that ground mass, so these are kind of um, compositional transects moving from a sunstone into the ground mass, the ground mass was pretty variable in a number of, I mean, I should say relatively homogenous, but like, right, we're not seeing a, a huge decrease or a huge increase that would suggest that leaching was occurring. So at this stage, um, going in near surface uh, doesn't seem that plausible and I think it's likely magmatic. This is also supported by some oxygen isotope values that are more magnetic in um, their, their number. Um, if, if anyone, if you're unfamiliar with, without going into too much detail about um, oxygen isotopes, if this value is basically um, above like five and a half, six, it's probably magmatic. If it's lower, it means there were hydrothermal fluids involved, New York water, and that value would go down. So, so far, I have about three, four analyses of oxygen on sunstones, and they're all um, over six which tells me that they're likely not hydrothermal. Um, you could argue that, oh, maybe the, the timeline, the, the time it takes for oxygen to diffuse, for copper to diffuse, maybe those are different and copper occurred before the oxygen. But um, there are also, there's a very interesting mineral in sunstones called protoenstatite. It's a type of um, really odd type of pyroxene. And it is low pressure and very high temperature. So this also suggests a magmatic origin. And it is currently thought that that um, protoenstatite gives some of the green coloration. But I would argue that's still kind of up to, for debate. And to just show you some, just when these things are cut and faceted, um, they're unbelievable. 
And this one on the left was cut by um, Daryl's son, Nick Alexander, when he was like 16 years old. So it's also a really cool, um, I think, career option that at least I don't think I was ever talked to about when I was um, getting my bachelor's that, you know, there is like a whole world in gemology, not the metaphysical stuff, not going there, but in sort of um, cutting, grading, and it's just, it's pretty wild. So I'm just gonna, I won't, I won't go through sort of all these questions. Um, I just want to point out that basically, recently sunstones have been identified in Ethiopia. And this is pretty curious because Ethiopia and the extent of where these sunstones have been found is actually within the world's second youngest flood basalt province. So I'm starting to wonder if sunstones in fact are recording a really unique process that only occur in flood basalt provinces. And the only reason we see them in Oregon is because it's the youngest flood basalt. Their preservation potential isn't great. Um, and so I find it pretty interesting that this is very, um, this is still kind of, um, people will debate this, but that sunstones are coming out of Ethiopia and the approximate location is within the Ethiopian Yemen flood basalt province. The reason this is, um, I'll just kind of finish up with the reason this is controversial is because in over 20 years ago, there was a bunch of, there were a bunch of sunstones that started hitting the market. And um, you can imagine that with more material, it started to affect the price. But the curious thing was that there were no rough stones available for purchase from these new places. People were saying Tibet, China, Mongolia. Um, as it turned out, what was happening is people were taking clear plagioclase crystals, specifically andesine, and they were putting them in an oven under very fixed conditions with copper filings and diffusing copper into, the sun, into a clear crystal to produce an artificial sunstone. So now we have a lot of problems because the owners of um, a lot of these mines are incredibly hesitant when you know, they hear about new material coming out. So it is, it's, it's definitely something, you know, I hear about Ethiopia and I'm really stoked. Um, and to me, geologically, I find it, it would answer a lot of questions about why in fact we even see them in the CRBs. But um, until, you know, I see it, I'll, I will kind of have a little bit of hesitancy. And these photos are from, there was a, a study done basically trying to see what Oregon sunstones would look like if they were um, treated and it's pretty cool because it doesn't look like the natural ones we see, um, which to me is another line of evidence that the copper did not diffuse into the plagioclase post formation. And so I will just leave you with um, the fact that in addition to Oregon, Ethiopia, where sunstones have been found, um, so 31 million years old, and all of those other sunstones that I mentioned from like China and Tibet, they were actually formed, they were actually found in some alluvial deposits, which could mean that maybe they were eroded from something else, especially when you have the Tibetan plateau um, and so much sort of uplift and movement of materials. So I think this is pretty cool. And my, my thought is basically that these are recording a really unique process and um, hopefully, NSF looks on me kindly, I can study them. And I'll give you um, just a little, actually I'll wait until we stop recording, but I have one piece of exciting news that I'll share um, once we're done recording. And these are just me with a few of the other mine owners. This is um, Bruce from the Northern Mine, John Aldrich from Double Eagle, Dave Wheatley from Sunstone Butte, um, also known as Panamines, Mines, and Don Buford from Dust Devil. So. Definitely fun to meet some cool people. And I'm done. It was a lot. <laughs> very nice. Very, very nice, Emily. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was, wow. I didn't realize. I, I read your paper in GSA both and it came out. And I, mm -hmm. this is great. Good. Yes. 
So we had one question that went back to the Argon, Argon ages. Could you kind of go over what the plateaus are there? Oh, um, yes, of course. Just real quick, there was a question about um, the error. So I will, let's see here. I wonder, can I use, can I use this plateau or should I go all the way back? Sure, no, I'm, that one's fine. Okay. Just the gray um, boxes, yeah. Yeah, so the gray boxes, basically when you have a sample um, and it's, it's really small, it has to get irradiated. Um, and each, basically each box is one analysis of a sample. And it has to do with basically the various isotopes, various isotopes of argon within your sample. Um, and also it has some amount of an error associated with it. So basically the height of the box relates to the amount of error in every single analysis on this plateau. And I would argue I'm okay with um, errors that might be a little bit bigger in individual steps if you can have a lot of steps. I think if you looked at a paper from 10 years ago, sometimes plateaus may only have like five, six, seven, eight steps. And I'm not, I'm not pooing on those plateaus, but I think there's a lot more, I think the ages are much more robust, even if the errors are bigger, if you have more of these analyses, so basically more of these little um, rectangles, and then ideally you can draw a line through as many, like a flat line through as many as possible. Um, and that correlates approximately to an age. Sometimes you don't get a plateau. And so when we say plateau age, it's ideally that you have sort of a plateau through these different um, heating increments. And so even with like the, the plage down here, in this case, they're just um, like magenta little boxes, but it's the same idea, right? Where each height is the error. And, you know, in this case, I had at least, I think like 15 ish um, steps. Now I could make a plateau age through all of these other ones, but if I do that, um, the age shifts a little bit and what's at my, what they call it MSWD, which is sort of a measurement of how good the age is a little bit, um, that shifts a little bit. And so ideally you, in a perfect world, you wanna be able to draw a straight flat line through as many of these boxes as possible with as little room to shift kind of up and down. And so if I included these boxes, there would be more shifting and I don't want that. So that's why these last, but six boxes weren't included. Cool, good. Well, just let, if people want to ask questions, you just ask a question. Yeah. There was a question on chat too um, about Yellowstone. Yeah. Um, okay, so there are sunstones associated with the Yellowstone volcanic field found in post formation basalts in the eastern area of the volcanic field. So um, I've definitely, since I started working on this, I have had a few you know, instances where people say, oh, you know, there's sunstones here, there's sunstones there. There are absolutely places where copper has been found in feldspar crystals. These are not the only, like this isn't the only place um, entirely, but typically they're either really small, more localized, um, or such that the copper abundance is like, copper in sunstones is about 300 parts per million. And in some of the other ones that I'm familiar with, they're closer to, you know, maybe like a hundred, if that. And I have, I have heard of a few places, but I have never, put it this way, I've heard of places, but I haven't seen anything. And sometimes I also rely on the, the mine owners to learn more about what's out there because they are actually impacted 
um, kind of on a day to day basis more if there's more material coming out and they have basically more competition. Um, and so sometimes if I hear of a place, I may ask one of the mine owners and they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, it was in small quantities. Um, so and that's that's actually one of the things that's kind of hard about this work is because it it's great in that it straddles, um, you know, scientific research that includes gemology. But it does get a little sticky sometimes with um, because it involves money. And so unfortunately, you know, I hear about Ethiopian sunstones and I get all excited, but I also recognize that there's a chance um, Plagioclase is there, but someone diffused copper in. There's a chance that um, they're not there in the first place and someone's just trying to ruffle a, a few feathers. So you just have to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, so I guess, you know, in some cases it sort of has its um, ups and downs. I thought but there were a lot of But if you have politics. any pictures, I was just gonna say, if, if um, Kate, if you have any pictures of these, I would be super curious to see them. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I was gonna say, I thought there was a lot of politics in universities, but wow, man, sunstone mining, there we go. There's a lot going on, um, good. The, actually, the last time I was at one of the Southern Sunstone Mines, as I was leaving, uh, I left. And once I got into service, I got a call from an Oregon State um, police officer that a, uh, a, a rig that was near one of the mines had been lit on fire. And had I seen anybody near... So you do get some, some, interesting, <laughs> some interesting things uh politics and um yeah if when there's money involved people get people get amped oh kate here can you hear me yes okay um so i collected the sample myself and um it, it, there's a there's a cone i didn't go to the cone i was on a field trip and there, it seems like it's maybe confined to one flow and they're very, they're gemmy and, um, and they're fairly, some of them are fairly large. We were there just in a very short period of time. So um, it's always a place I've wanted to go back to. So that's interesting. And to be honest, I would be stoked if this turned out to be something, you know, for my own research benefit. Um, stoked if, if this was something that is, you know, I'm actually right that it has, it's recording some interesting um, petrogenetic process associated with flood basalt provinces, mantle plumes. Um, so that's pretty, will you, um, will you send me a, like an email with a picture, if you don't mind? Uh, it might take me a little bit. I have to go dig it out of the box it's in, in the garage. Oh. But that's good, yeah. Um, might have something from the field too. So yeah, I, I'll get something to you. Is your no rush available somewhere? Yes, and I can put it in the chat too. I have like a hundred emails, so if you find one that's not this, it definitely still works. I've got a question for you, uh, Emily. Uh, I went to college some 40 years ago, and at that time, as I recall, there was the idea that if you had a large meteorite at the Earth, it would send shock waves throughout the globe, and there'd be focal points, and one of those would be opposite where it hit. And the fact that, that those lava flows in India are basically across from the uh, Gulf of Mexico, is there still any, any thoughts on that, or is that kind of a gone gone away that's a great question and to be honest i cannot speak um intelligently to that i don't know what the status is i have i do remember hearing that at some point and in fact i feel like somebody at actually wsu maybe not was working on it but i think that's where i heard that um sort of idea 
I cannot speak to that. I don't know. I wish I did. It's an interesting point. Yeah, it, it just I, like I said, that was some 40 years ago when I heard it and I thought, well, maybe that's that's old school. Yeah, it is old stuff. I heard it 50 years ago. I was just thought that that was a theory in my, you know, geology 200 level class last semester. So it's not super old still. Oh. Cool. I'll have to, um, I'll have to think about that. So how do we prove that? Do we get to have to have another meteorite hit us so we know if it happens or not? I don't know what kind of experiment you would have to devise to, to test something like that. Um, but if you come up with a solution, I'm all ears. Well, yeah, really something they can do up in the space station on a small scale where there's no gravity to interfere with it. Well, it's interesting. I think you mentioned the that NASA. were dated beforehand, before the crater impact. Is that correct? Say that again. Sorry. Um, you, I think you had mentioned somewhere in your in your presentation that the traps we've had dates that precede the crater impact. Oh yeah. To be honest, so I remember going to that talk. It was late 2018 and I then recall talking about that talk like a couple months ago and being told that that whole idea had been kind of thrown out and in fact they, there was evidence now almost concretely that the Deccan traps those lava flows occurred after the asteroid and if that's true um I think there's a lot of like geodynamic questions that, because in that sense, it almost, it, it's hard to not wonder if the asteroid and the lava and the lava, like that huge eruption um, were correlated in some way, you know, which seems even saying something, you know, like an asteroid caused the largest volcanic eruption in Earth's history, like verbalizing that sounds a little wild, but if if the asteroid did in fact occur first, um, it's hard not to kind of wonder. I had heard sometime that uh, the fossil hunters had said uh, the numbers of fossil dinosaur fossils were in decline for about a million years prior to Chicxulub, and that Chicxulub clearly finished them. So there, I don't know what what they're uh -huh. in deck and traps, but somewhere I had read that in in a they a, a, a story somewhere that uh, they had counted uh, a decline in dinosaurs. So that that, was, that may have been one of the lines of evidence for, in addition to the ages, um, right. for those folks saying that um, the Deccan traps occurred, like started erupting prior to the asteroid. There's also, so one thing, um, one of what I mentioned kind of halfway through that my PhD research has sort of prompted um, maybe, maybe like five different questions. And the last one was, was really on the sunstones. One of them was this sort of weird age gap that I found in the picture gorge basalt dates that I collected. Granted, I had like 14. So, you know, you could argue, okay, well, you don't have enough. Um, I actually, because I'm a sucker for punishment, went through every single date that had ever been published on the CRB and taking into consideration errors, decay constants, standards, mm -hmm all that basically tried to explore if that age gap existed in the CRBs because something like that, you can't really determine unless you have a crap load of data. And interestingly, I did, we do see this, um, this gap in time. So this weird period of 0.4 million years that Picture Gorge wasn't erupting is 
also mirrored in CRVs. And I was talking to someone, I bring this up because I have a colleague who works on the Deccan. And I asked him about this, like, do you see a gap in time with the Deccan? And his response was basically, yes, but the, the age, this, this gap in time doesn't make a lot of sense with the observed stratigraphy. So by that, I mean the, this period that there shouldn't be any eruptions um, and that the next basalt, it, it doesn't, you don't get what looks even like any sort of unconformity. So, and it hasn't been published or anything because um, it doesn't make sense entirely with the stratigraphy, but I bring it up because I, I think about if, if these two pulses um, of volcanism occur in the CRB and it's been proposed in the Deccan, you know, could, in theory, could you have had a situation where there was like an initial pulse of volcanism in the Deccan that maybe influenced um, some species to go extinct? And then you had the asteroid and then you maybe have the bulk of volume of the rest of the Deccan that, so it was kind of a three sucker punch. I'm completely speculating, but I, I say that because this interesting gap in, in ages, you really would only know if you'd done a crap load of dating. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's, it's possible that, yeah, early Deccan maybe had some impact on the dinosaurs. Asteroid really finished them off and then, um, the bulk of the volume erupted later. Changing the subject a little, um, I'm Gary's, Gary Kleitnick's brother, and I'm here at his invitation. Um, but I had never heard of sunstones before, so I did the normal thing. I asked Mr. Google, and uh, I read a little bit about him in, uh, on Wikipedia. And Wikipedia said something a little different from what I heard here today, but maybe you hit on the differences. Uh, Wikipedia gave um, sources from, it didn't mention Oregon or Ethiopia, but it mentioned a, a site uh, on the East Coast, probably New Jersey, Scandinavia, Norway, and Sweden. And uh, I don't right off recall where, where else they found them. But they're probably not the same kind of copper content or might even be uh, salted. I don't know, but they're different. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I haven't, I'm surprised if that's, I don't know of any localities on the East Coast, um, but if you go to GIA's website has a, a portion on the Gemological Institute of America has a portion on colored um, stones mm -hmm. and they would be more credible for like kind of, uh, you know, pretty digestible information. And granted they come from the gemology side of things, mm -hmm. but they are more, I would say their organization has the most integrity in terms of groups that have looked into sunstones. Interesting about Norway and Sweden though. Yeah, well there's probably a not... variety, large variety of things that may or may not be sunstones and they are if you decide to call them that. That's, you know what, that's a good point because with sunstones, it's, it's easy to say they're copper enriched labradorite, but technically they're not super enriched in copper. 300 ppm is just a lot compared to nothing, um, but it's not like you're not gonna mine them for copper. And in theory, copper, sometimes if it's in lower abundances, they're, they're just clear and, or in the gem world, champagne. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you could, pro you could have a gem quality sunstone that was really just um, plagioclase feldspar that had minimal internal fractures. It didn't necessarily have to have any copper, 
But if they're large enough and they have not a ton of internal um, kind of fractures, you could cut and facet it. And so in that sense, you could probably call it a sunstone. Mm -hmm. That's probably what's going on. Good point though. That's interesting. Definitely yeah, seem to be oh. more metamorphic. Oh. Go ahead. No, oh, after you. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious when you're like out in the field uh, looking for sunstone samples, like what is, what are some indicators to you that it's you know, this particular sample might have some interesting scientific information for you? That's, that's a great question. Um, to be honest, they're everywhere, like all over the place. The really nice ones, not so much. Um, but now that I have spent time with the owners, what tends to happen is if an owner finds a sample that he thinks I'm interested in, he'll save it. And then I actually literally just got a box of sunstones from one of the mines. And like, literally it says inclusions for Emily. <laughs> like I just got this in the mail the other day. <laughs> um, but when I'm out in the field, to be honest, and this, this sometimes becomes a little bit of not a problem, but I think it's just the opposite of what some people would expect. When I'm in the field, instead of, caring about the sunstones because I can get those if I need. I'm more curious about the petrogenesis, like how these basalts have plagioclase that have copper in them. I'm kind of interested in the whole story. So I end up actually being much more interested in the basalt that hosts them. And if I want to get a sample for geochemistry, ideally, I want it to be pretty fresh. So like minimal vesicles, not really oxidized, um, just looks kind of clean. And so to do that, I'll you know take a sledge and try to get a piece on the inside. One thing that is, that is tough uh, sometimes though, is that when you're out there, a lot of, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, look at this, look at the sunstone, look at this sunstone. And it's hard to say, I'm actually not super interested in the stones themselves. I'm interested in the lava flows and sort of their thickness. Um, how laterally continuous are they? And that just seems crazy because if you're out there, like why wouldn't you want to look at gorgeous um, red gemstones? And some of the brightest red ones have actually been confused for rubies. Well, if you know your gems um, and you have tools, you probably wouldn't confuse them, but if you saw it in a ring, um, you may not have any idea. But out there, I'm typically more interested in, yeah, the, the basalt flows themselves. And this, this is uh, one of the reasons that some folks say that, they're high, that sunstones are formed from hydrothermal processes, is that sunstones are typically found in this really weathered, crappy, altered basalt. So you could argue, okay, well, maybe there were some hydro, uh, hydrothermal fluids moving through that put the copper into the sunstones and then the basalt itself looks like garbage. But it's almost, you could be biasing yourself because it's obviously easy, easier and cheaper for people to mine sunstones out of crappy, friable, falling apart rock, right? You don't need a drill. Um, you literally can just like scoop it up with a shovel and throw it into, um, like a kind of like a what am I like like a sieve almost and then there'll be pickers looking through so the observation that sunstones are found in highly weathered oxidized basalt that absolutely happens but they the fact that their majority found in that might actually be an observation bias just because it's cheaper to extract them that way But I don't know that it that's something that's interesting. Um, and because if you're trying to learn more about the basalt that hosts sunstones, trying to analyze crappy altered basalt is not going to provide you with many answers. 
So that yeah. might be a nice place to bring up your plagioclase ages being half the age of the basalt. Is Were those from your unhappy basalt, your poorly treated friable material? I, I chose a really nice, fresh piece to do the dating on. And I dated the ground mass three times. And that's where the 16.18 age came from. The plage I dated, the sunstone I dated twice and both times pretty consistently about eight. Um, I will mention though, that as of last week, actually some new new data, Should I pause there you? is, uh, there's, there's some folks at um, Auburn University and it's a, a Bill Hames, a uh, professor at Auburn and his master's student, um, Cecil Badur. She just uh, proposed her master's a week ago and she dated, I sent her a bunch of um, samples and she actually dated one of the sunstones from the Southern mine because all of my age data is from that Northern mine. She dated a sunstone from the Southern mine and got an age of about 10.5. So we don't have any ages on the basalt at the Southern locations. That is what, um, they're sending the samples for irradiation shortly. So we should know in the next um, couple months, but I'm pretty intrigued that already, you know, from these two locations, the geochem is the same. The age is, you know, not exactly the same because eight and 10 are not the same, um, but pretty young, not CRB. And so if, if her basalt, um, and it was a sample that I sent, so I, I know exactly like, what you know sort of how how fresh it was if that in fact turns out to be um crbh i think we can say with a lot of confidence that whatever the process is uh that is making the sunstones younger um, is definitely occurring at at both locations yeah i i just think about mitomic zircons like broken up zircons where the gases can release so yeah I, but I'm not a mark. Yeah, I. Artist. So I haven't done any. Um, I haven't done any zircon work, but there are some um, beds down there. These like red bole units. So actually, I want to. I want to actually collect to see if there's any zircons in them. And, but with regard to the argon, I some of these sunstones are fractured, and so I think, I think the younger ages are actually coming from argon loss. I think the younger ages are not correct, um, which would also make sense for why my plages are so atmospheric. But I think they're undergoing argon loss and the ages, while the plateau may seem really nice, I think they're just erroneously young. I think the basalt, and that'll be um, confirmed, hopefully, once we get the, the ground mass ages from, from further south. Since I have your attention. I could talk about this all day, so definitely shut me up whenever. Um. So does that mean you're, you're gonna add like a little connection between uh, on Vic's, or Vic Camp's map of the Columbia River basalts? It looked like you had definitely your basalt was in an area that basalts weren't mapped as much. And they seem to go down to the steams where the oldest rocks were as well. Is there a, some more mapping coming out? Um, Vic, Vic and I are in discussions, let's put it that way, um, where it's a, a friendly disagreement of, well, I shouldn't even call it a disagreement. It's more, it really comes down to the question of how do you correlate across a large spatial area when you don't have, you're not afforded the luxury of beautiful outcrops, um, you know, like sequences of lava flows and instead have kind of um, scattered, isolated, um, you know, almost like one or two lavas or a dike, start to wonder what is, what kind of supersedes what? Is it the geochemical signature to correlate with a subunit? Or is it, um, you know, thinking about like basically the stratigraphic code? Because you can't, it's, it's hard to argue that we want to extend distribution when 
we the stratigraphy sort of falls apart because we don't have nice sequences. And that's that's kind of the discussion that we're in. Um, because there have been some um, almost in the Steen's extent that have more of a picture gorge signature. So instead of mapping, I would say it is more a focus on how how you think about correlation when you don't have outcrops and what are you going to put more value in um, sort of stratigraphic sequences and correlation or geochemical correlation. And it's tricky, um, especially some of the earliest Imnaha flows actually geochemically um, look a lot like the picture gorge basalt. And if anyone is statistically inclined, I even did a um, principal component analysis comparing some of these early Imnaha flows with known picture gorge and known Imnaha. And these early Imnaha flows actually um, end up being predicted as picture gorge. So instead of, I would argue, I it it's hard to talk about stratigraphy, and I would say it almost becomes a question of what is the picture gorge signature, um, and a lot of it is in, uh, high elevations of or high concentrations of of specific elements, and so it might be worth asking you know, what is really causing that? And in fact, is it just that early products of flood basalt volcanism in Oregon have this, this particular signature? And so it's not a matter of like stratigraphic correlation, but more so what does this geochemical signature indicate? I don't know if that was too off base. I like it. It's like we lost Larry though. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that has yeah, so you have been talking for a long time i'm sorry i just realized that too um cool uh, are there any more questions if, if emily's cool with, with sticking around for I have more one or okay. one quick question uh it's a fun a very basic mineralogy question basalt is a very fine-grained rock implying rapid cooling and feldspars are large grain implying slow cooling. So how do we mix them together? That's actually a very excellent question. Um, and typically it's sort of understood that the these larger crystals formed at some depth and then were basically remobilized when that basaltic liquid, um, that basaltic magma, you know, kind of entrained them and brought them to the surface. However, the not sunstone specific, um, but in flood basalts, there are something, there's a type of feature called giant plagioclase basalt, GPBs. They are often associated with flood basalts and basically they're basaltic lavas that have really big plagia in them. And to your question, there are still, we actually don't know exactly why giant plagioclase basalts are so characteristic of flood basalt volcanism. There have been different um, models proposed and one of the more recent ones was just a couple years ago, but I would argue um, it was by a guy named Chef and it was just one author I can't remember what year it was, but I think it was in GSA Bull. And it was a it was a model of basically in flood basalt provinces, you get almost like a raft floating on top of plagioclase because once plagioclase crystallizes, assuming it's coming out of a basaltic melt, it's gonna be less dense sometimes. And so it can actually float on top of the basalt in the sort of magma chamber. And this, this idea of like a plagioclase raft has been proposed and I think to some degree um, pretty well demonstrated in some much older rocks like um, in like Michigan and stuff. But 
the but the idea that could that still be occurring in flood basalt provinces that have erupted in the last like um, hundred million years, I think is kind of up for debate. And this this study by Chef, I think it was 2014 in GSA Bull. He has a very uh, it's a great I think it's a good paper and it has a, he has like an interesting model of a plagioclase raft that then this basaltic liquid comes up and sort of remobilizes a lot of those crystals. So to your point, you get um, rapid cooling of the ground mass, but then you have these large crystals. The issue I would say with this model um, was that there was pretty limited geochem to support some of these findings. And more so, I think that if, and I haven't um, done any significant research into this, but I would argue that if you had a plagioclase raft sitting on top of a huge basaltic chamber, right, magma body of sorts, and the basaltic liquid is then entraining some of these large plage crystals, in theory, wouldn't you get almost um, like enclaves or like chunks of entire, almost like anorthosite, like chunks of plage incorporated into the basalt, you know, but we don't see coalesced, uh, we do see big crystals, but we don't see like, you know, large chunks of um, almost like xenoliths, but we call them enclaves because they would be related to the magma. We don't see that. I'm not saying that because we don't see that, therefore this can't occur, but that combined with sort of minimal geochemistry to support that idea, I'm not entirely on board, but I think, I think there's something very valuable in um, that idea. So they formed at depth, but how they got incorporated into the basalt is variable. So you find them, but the mechanism is still uh, up for grabs. Okay. Long story long that I made, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's getting close to my bedtime. I don't know about you guys, um, but yeah. So, so Emily has her email on the on the the chat there. Uh, wonderful talk, and thank you. That was a great discussion. I liked it. We hit a lot of stuff. That was great. So, thank you very much for coming today. Um, if you are around next week, we'll have Joanna Redwine talk about some trench work out in Oregon, um, in the Gales Creek Fault uh, at Eastern Washington University and Columbia Basin Geologic Society. Um, you can also email me um, if you have questions about that. I'm Chad, I'm at Eastern. And big thanks to Emily Cahoon um, and Lloyd. And then we had, uh, where did Gary? Gary's gone, but the, the Ice Age Flood Institute for, for hosting tonight. Thank you, Emily. Woo. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and I do, if, uh, do you have a bunch of students here? I think some. Some? Um, after you stop recording, I just have one um, kind of interesting bit if anyone's interested. Oh, I can stop recording. Without.